so now all of after all of those optimizations it takes us to a next class of optimization so to say which are to do with loops okay and loops are a very big chunk of what we try to do in terms of overall optimizations okay in any kind of code in the context of software typically what we would do would be that we you know initialize a counter we either increment or decrement depending on you know it's a for loop for i is equal to 0 i less than 100 i plus plus increment right if it was i minus minus decrement and so on but every time that you are going through this you also need to test the condition and then there is a branch involved right either you need to branch back to the beginning of the loop or continue okay so there is usually some penalty involved with branching because especially for a pipelined processor right usually what would happen is by the time you get the branch you have decoded it you have figured out whether it needs to be executed or not some three clock cycles have passed three or more clock cycles have passed right what should you do during that time right should you be continuing execution of new operator new instructions or should you abandon it and say you know i'll just wait until i don't know whether the branch is taken or not okay in turn that has given reason to a lot of optimizations at the hardware level in terms of something called branch prediction okay which basically tries to say given a certain type of code can i intelligently or rather you know based on some history or something else can i predict whether or not the branch would be taken and decide accordingly whether to you know continue with my code or whether to jump back and do something else okay so in the software level those are the kinds of overheads that are involved when you are implementing loops on the hardware level on the other hand how are loops implemented they are typically going to be some kind of a finite state machine plus a counter right once again the same story right the finite state machine needs to check some condition there will be some multiplexing which decides whether i need to jump back to the state or whether i need to proceed and similarly there will be some multiplexing which decides you know what inputs should be given to the computational units okay and on top of that if there is some read or write operation involved over there from uh, memory that in turn would add extra latency right bottom line is whether you are working with software or hardware there are definitely overheads associated with loops which leads to a whole lot of loop oriented optimizations okay which we will now get into one by one so the first one that we can think of is something called an induction variable optimization okay so what do i mean by induction variable over here basically what i'm saying is the loop variable i in this case is what we call the induction variable okay so when i say i is equal to 0 i less than n i plus plus i is called the induction variable right now what do i do with this if i look at this computation i am basically computing j is equal to 4 into i plus 3 and then y is equal to f of j okay now what does that involve every time inside the loop i basically need to do a multiplication and an addition okay and the question is could i have got away without that right so what i'm going to propose is let's see if i could rewrite my loop in some way such that the multiplication and addition inside the loop are not required okay i know that this is anyway required right i can't really avoid this addition you know in uh, incrementing the induction variable is unavoidable right because after all i need to do something over there in order to check whether it is uh, done with the loop or i need to uh, continue the loop for some more time okay but if that is the case what if i rewrite my code like this for j is equal to 3 j less than 4 in 4 into n plus 3 j plus equal to 4 okay so what have i done i have essentially said a couple of things right this 4 into n plus 3 remember is going to be a constant i am not modifying n inside the loop right so i can just basically do a 
constant propagation plus code hoist and bring it outside the loop okay this is going to be one addition right this was one mult one add and of course this was also one add right instead i have replaced it with just one add over here corresponding to the j equal to j plus 4 and now i can just say y is equal to f of j inside the loop okay so what i have done over here is once again made use of the property that you know similar to what i was doing in the case of 2 into pi into fc into i right i could have done something there as well i could have declared as a constant t is equal to 2 into pi into fc C, and then i could have said every time you just replace instead of doing that t into i just take some new value t1 and say t1 is equal to t1 plus t right because i know that i is always going 0 1 2 3 and so on every time the increment is always going to be that value t in this case every time the increment is going to be the value 4 okay so as long as i know that i have eliminated the multiplication and i have replaced it with one single simple addition okay so this kind of whenever we have a loop if the induction variable of the loop is in turn used for, for some computation, right? you can sort of try and apply this kind of optimization. Can I find places where that computation being done with the induction variable can be simplified? Okay. Loop fission and loop fusion. So now we are actually getting to a set of optimizations that depend not just on how you know the overhead associated with the loop but also on the fact that you know we are going to be that, that we need to know a little bit about the kind of memory structure that we are dealing with okay so in order to explain this loop fission and loop fusion i actually need to bring in this uh, concept of the memory hierarchy or what kind of memory am i assuming for my system the kind of hardware system that I am uh, assuming is something like this. There is a CPU right? and there is a main memory which is large but which is typically DRAM which means it is large but slow and what I mean by slow is that it typically takes several clock cycles in order to respond to a given read request. right? Of course, DRAM also has nice properties in the sense that it has nice burst mode read capabilities, right? Meaning that once you start reading, you can read many values quickly one after the other. But reading the first value typically takes a certain amount of time. So what we do in such a situation is usually I put something called a cache, right? Now this cache sits in between the main memory and the CPU. How does this work? This is fast but small. Okay. And the assumption is that any time that the CPU tries to read from main memory, right, I will first look in the cache, see if the data is already present in the cache. If it is not, then I will bring the data in from main memory, store it in the cache and then do the computation okay now why exactly is this useful right cache memory is useful because of something called locality of reference right this is an observation it is not some kind of golden rule or anything of the sort it is an observation from many different programming projects over many years right people have identified and of course there are also logical reasons for it but typically what you find is that if I am accessing some programming some memory location i there is a high probability that I will also be interested in location i plus 1 i plus 2 i plus 3 and so on okay why does that happen because you know typically you are storing related chunks of data let's say it's a numerical computation right where what are the numbers that you would be storing in memory it would typically be let's say elements of a matrix right and those elements obviously if you are trying when would you want to read them let's say that you are trying to do a matrix multiplication operation in which case you are usually interested in one entire row or one entire column right 
and uh, the values in one row are typically going to be one after the other. Okay, so this kind of structure where I have a main memory which is large but slow and a cache memory which is fast but small, right, mean that I need to be careful about how I structure my accesses to memory. Okay, and that is where this business of loop fission and loop fusion come in. Okay, so cache memory also has this thing where it has something called a cache line. So a line read basically means that let's say I read location n from main memory implies it, it will also read in n plus 1, n plus 2, etc. up to some n plus thumb size, one cache line at a time. So an example is, let's say that a cache line, right, could be, let's say, 64 bytes, okay, which basically means that if we try reading one 32-bit int, right, which is 4 bytes, it will actually read How many? The uh, 64 by 4 equal to 16 ints and store them in the cache. Okay. So, this fact that caches usually work in burst mode, right? I mean, if I try to read one element, it usually rather than reading one element, it tries to read some n elements or s elements and keep them in the cache, right? That turns out to be useful in a lot of cases. The problem is, for this particular code that I have written over here, right? Let's just look at the first for loop, right? This is actually not good from the point of view of a cache. Why am I saying that? Because this is accessing A and then this is accessing B and then repeat, okay? Now, Unfortunately, because of the way caches work, right, there is a possibility that A and B get mapped into the same region of the cache. Okay. I am not getting into details of how that, you know, the associativity of caches and cache mapping and so on are done in practice, right. Um, if somebody is not clear about it, then please let me know and I will, you know, uh, put additional material separately outside of this class, which sort of discusses that in a little bit more detail, okay? But for the time being, the important thing to keep in mind is whatever I have said over here, right? That caches basically work in at the cache line level that they take in data from main memory and then, you know, do certain uh, uh, storing data in bulk. All of the, that essentially, uh, uh, you know, yeah, it, it means that there is a possibility that both A and B in this particular case, in the case of this for loop, might end up going into the same area of the cache. If that is the case, what will happen for, uh, with this for loop? First, I will read in one value of A, okay? First read A, pull into cache. Then read B of I, push A out, pull B into cache, then read A of I plus 1, will again push B out, read A back, okay. How could I avoid this? What if I instead rewrote it as for and inside this I did a of i equal to a of i plus 10 and have a separate for loop that basically says b of i equals b of i into 7. Okay. So in other words, this thing basically I do fission. 
right? I have broken one loop into two parts. Why? In this way, each of the individual loops can run faster because it is more cache friendly. Right? Now, on the other hand, let us consider also the third loop or rather this is a second loop which has now become the third loop. Right? What would happen over here? This is now using A of i. Okay? A of i was computed earlier in some other loop and now I have written another loop out here which basically computes something depending on A of i. Okay? What if I move this in here? and make it into something which also does c of i equals a of i by 3. Now this is a little bit tricky, right? So what would be done over here would be I would be doing fusion, right? And fusion basically saying that two otherwise distinct loops are now being combined into one, right? What could happen over here is that most likely I will benefit because of the fact that the A of i is now already sitting in my, uh, you know, I have just read in A of i, I have done some computation with it, I immediately compute the C of i. This will work perfectly provided A and C do not clash in the locations where they get stored in the cache memory. But on the other hand, if they also in turn clash over there, right? both A and C are trying to compete for the same location in the cache memory, just like A and B were, we will once again run into trouble. But assuming that that does not happen, this fusion, this combining two loops together is actually very effective in this case. In the first case, fission was required because A and B were mapped onto the same area of the cache. In the second case, fusion was required because A and C are mapped into different areas of the cache and more importantly C uses whatever I am computing with A. So combining them into the same loop reduces overheads.